Good morning. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. This Sunday morning is January 1, the first day of the new year. Um, have you gotten into the, uh, it's not a habit yet, into the, the mindset of writing 2023? Uh, I, ha I don't think I've written 2023 yet. We'll see how that goes. Today we return to our study from John's Gospel after uh, studying uh, Luke's account of the birth of Jesus last week on Christmas morning. I certainly hope that uh, you had a wonderful Christmas, a time with family and a time to pause even more so and thank God for the greatest gift, our Savior, Jesus. Now, I suppose I ought to begin by wishing you a happy new year, but you've already started your new year if you're just now looking at this lesson, Sunday, January 1, 2023. Let's, uh, let's jump in, maybe recount real quickly because it's important that we know what John is writing about and why he's writing his gospel account. He told us in chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was uh, with God and the word was God. He is both God and man. And then chapter two, we see from John's account, Jesus' first miracle changing the water into wine at a wedding feast he was attending and at least according to John's account, uh, Jesus uh, cleansing the temple while he's there in Passover week, uh, turning the tables on the money changers, running the uh, selling of uh, the uh, merchandising of uh, the temple by selling uh, the sacrificial lambs and doves, uh, so that people who were coming for Passover uh, would have a sacrificial animal. But uh, because that's a good part, the bad part was uh, they were charging such exorbitant fees or believed that's the part of it. Uh, and the bustle, the hustle, if you will, of uh, the mercantile market uh, dip, uh, distracts greatly from those who would come to worship God. And then, uh, as we say, last week's lesson uh, it was on the birth of Jesus. We went to Luke chapter 2. Now we return, and we return to the third chapter of Luke. It is so full of material and meaning that uh, we will never uh, have enough time in one session to cover it all, or even the uh, verses 4 through 18, which are our focal passages for today. Charles Spurgeon, some say, is maybe the greatest preacher of all time. He wrote, uh, he wrote this, and I thought this is a proper introduction to uh, our study of John chapter 3. If we were asked to read to a dying man who did not know the gospel, we should probably select this chapter as the most suitable one for such an occasion. And what is good for dying man is good for us all, for that is what we are, and how soon we may be actually at the gates of death, none of us can tell. Our passage um, is beginning at chapter, I mean, verse 4. Um, but it's kind of hard to do a beginning in the middle uh, without knowing the context and what we're writing about. Um, uh, Sean Thomas, I believe, it, I'm almost sure it was Sean Thomas in his uh, blog for Lifeway, on, uh, who writes our curriculum uh, that we study from in the, these lessons. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, I take it back. It doesn't matter if it was uh, Sean Thomas or if it was the curriculum material itself. 
Uh, and I just realized it's uh, someone else who uh, uh, it's from a, a site called jesuswalk.com and uh, tell they began by uh, the illustration of people are drawn to celebrities uh, wanting to be near glamour and fame perhaps hoping some of it will rub off on us uh, well in a similar fashion people were drawn to Jesus uh, they many were attracted by his actions his miracles and sadly they went no further no deeper but today's lesson is about a man who did go deeper Nicodemus a man who was a celebrity to some extent in his own right among the Jewish people we l learn most of what we know about him in these first three verses which are not a part of part of our focal passage but we're going to look at that real quickly now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus Nicodemus is a Greek name nevertheless he is a member of the Jewish ruling council he came to Jesus at night and said rabbi we know you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the miracle uh, the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him and Jesus replied very interestingly in verse 3 in reply Jesus declared I tell you the truth no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again now that seems a little bit out of place and almost out of context as a reply because it says in reply is it replying he is replying to Nicodemus uh, a member of the ruling body of the Jews that is the Sanhedrin uh, and he was a Pharisee which means he was uh, overly I say overly he was totally devout um, and yet uh, uh, well the Pharisees were strict observers of the law they went too far and and drew Jesus condemnation um, because um, they almost were holier than thou if you if you can get it that way and they were missing the boat and thus that might be Jesus reply I tell you the truth no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again Nicodemus is apparently seeking he is seeking more he comes to Jesus at night he is one of the very few uh, who are seekers of Je one of the very few from the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin who uh, don't condemn Jesus there were others who said that uh, <clears throat> Jesus uh, miracles were of the devil Nicodemus recognizes that uh, Jesus miracles the signs he was performing could only be from God and so he says uh, no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him and so he comes seeking more why did he come at night um, three at least three possible ideas one is fear uh, Joseph of Arimathea who uh, assisted uh, Nicodemus in and provided the uh, uh, the cave burial plot if you will where Jesus was buried after his crucifixion um, did not publicly identify himself with Jesus uh, chapter 19 verse 38 because he feared the Jews so perhaps Nicodemus uh, also feared the Jews and the rest of the Sanhedrin and what they would do although I, I believe it's in chapter 7 I'm going from memory and not looking at not trying to find it in my notes uh, that Nicodemus spoke up in at least partial defense of Jesus maybe he came at night out of caution um, which I think is related to the fear aspect uh, but maybe 
he did not want to be seen endorsing the teachings of this new teacher until he himself was sure of uh, the validity of the teacher and his source. I understand that. Uh, I try to search and look for all kinds of different um, sources from different scholars, different commentaries in putting together or trying to present a lesson uh, that we record each week and present on Sunday and leave it up uh, on the, the uh, either Facebook or our uh, YouTube. Uh, so I think that's proper. I started to, I didn't finish. I look at those sources and sometimes uh, I look to see or find out material about the writer of the commentary, if it's a commentary, <clears throat> because I don't want to be citing that commentary and thus uh, somewhat lifting up that author if that author uh, is... Uh, is a fraud or a fake or, or espouses other uh, types of information that just do not hold water. And so maybe Nicodemus was coming at night so as not to appear to be endorsing Jesus until he knew more about Jesus. Uh, another possibility, and uh, some think it's the best possibility, is mere accessibility. That is, he would have a greater chance to have access to Jesus if Jesus would accept him in um, at night. And then he wouldn't be interrupted by all the others who were coming uh, to try to be close to Jesus, the part we talked about at the beginning, or who had questions or who needed or wanted healing. <clears throat> so he came so that he might have more opportunities for a longer con uh, conversation and uh, the asking of uh, earnest questions. Uh, he called Jesus rabbi, which we usually associate with teacher, but it also in Hebrew means great one. Uh, and he recognizes that Jesus is from God. Jesus replied to him, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, the born again, we need to talk about that real quickly, as well as what does Jesus mean by the kingdom of God. Um, several different commentaries that I, again, I look at several. I think kingdom of God here uh, is uh, another term that Jesus used a great deal, uh, but it basically, or a shorthand rendition might be eternal life in the presence of God and Jesus himself. Um, but born again, that's interesting. And we don't have time to jump into all of this. Um, there's just not enough time. But born again, uh, what does that mean? Nicodemus struggled with what it means. And there we get into uh, the beginning of our focal passages this morning, even after I've used almost half of our time. How can a man be born or born again when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Nicodemus, we also must remember, is a ruler, a member of the ruling body, the Sanhedrin. Uh, he is a Pharisee. That means he is highly educated. He knows the law. Um, Jesus is going to... The, I refer to him in just a bit uh, also as one who teaches the law or reads and knows the law. Um, where is he coming from in having difficulty with Jesus' question? Uh, it must be born again. How can, can you get back into the womb when you're old? How can you do that? One other commentary I thought was interesting says, in essence, he's really not asking uh out of his confusion, because he is obviously confused, how do you get back in the womb and then go through a physical birth process? He may be asking something like, uh, uh, we think of the phrase, uh, it's difficult to teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, so how can I 
learn again or how can somebody uh, who ha has as much experience and age as I do uh, learn again? Um, he is confused, though. Um, and, and I think we can understand, but uh, uh, Jesus responds to him, I tell you the truth, uh, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. I'm getting ahead. I left something out about the uh, born again. Uh, the word again <clears throat> can also be translated from above. And so some translations and some commentaries uh, prefer the uh, Jesus prefer that Jesus is saying, you must be born from above, which is sort of uh, followed up by these verses I just started to read, uh, verses uh, 5 through 8, um, from above, uh, from God, uh, as opposed to being born again. Or one translation, uh, one translation for again might be anew, born again anew or born again. Um, so let's look at how Jesus answers him. Uh, and we get really, really deep. And I don't want to spend too much time in the depth um, because we do not want to miss the part of our lesson that is most famous, most... Uh, most memorized verse, and I think to some extent what Spurgeon was talking about in that opening quote, uh, John 3.16. But let's look at 5 through 8. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And we might as well pick up Nicodemus's response to that because he is still, obviously, he is still confused. How can this be, Nicodemus Asked. Now, some of the commentaries that I looked at, studied from, um, remind us that Nicodemus, that's where I started to go a while ago, is a member of the Sanhedrin as a Pharisee, a practicing, a educated and trained Pharisee. Those members of the class that he would be representing and most other Jews <clears throat> whether a Pharisee or certainly only a 70 in the Sanhedrin, they think they are children of Abraham. They are God's chosen people, and they are already assured of a, pray, a place in heaven. So what does this being born again have to do? Is it uh, just being uh, reformed? Uh, if so, they don't need that. So what are you talking about? Uh, how can this be, Nicodemus, uh, Nicodemus says. So what is being born of water and the Spirit? Now that gives us some difficulty. The word uh, water um, causes some to have some uh, difficulties with the translation. Um, does it mean baptism? There are some... Um, denominations, if you will, uh, who believe that uh, Christianity is associated with Christian baptism, uh, that a person cannot be saved without being baptized. Uh, we do not understand or believe that that's what it means. We do not believe that baptism is a part of salvation. It is instead merely a public pronouncement that I have in fact accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior 
and thus I am saved, not by the baptism, but by the placing of my faith and trust in Jesus. And I think Jesus goes on to explain that just a little bit more. Some think the word water is referencing the physical birth. That is, uh, the embryo is in the mother's womb, in, in essence, a sack of water. You've heard the expression, her water broke, and thus delivery is now imminent. Uh, and that's a possibility since, since uh, uh, that this translation, I'm sorry, that this reference to Jesus, you must be born of the water and the spirit. It might be saying, okay, you must have been born, in fact, uh, and then be born of the spirit. Um, most people do not accept that possibility uh, as the possible uh, idea that Jesus is uh, pushing forth here. A third is that water is a cleansing uh, agent. We are washed, we are cleaned, and made clean. Uh, one, one interest, I thought an interesting commentary said, if Jesus said, you must be washed, cleansed, physically, uh, to be saved, the problem with that, if that's what he were to say, is that we could do that ourselves. We sometimes, we sometimes we ought to do it daily, uh, wash ourselves and cleanse ourselves. And, but he is not talking about something we can, he, Jesus, is not talking about something we can do ourselves. And so he is saying you must be born again of the spirit, something we cannot do of ourselves. Um, also, Nicodemus would not have experienced or seen a Christian baptism at this point. The only baptism that would have occurred or been relevant in Jesus' teachings at this point, now later Jesus gives the Great Commission, but at this point would have been John's baptism, John the Baptist baptism of Jesus and the people as a part of his preaching. And his preaching of baptism was a baptism of repentance. And so possibly of water and the spirit, Jesus is saying, you must repent. You must understand and recognize that you are a sinner and not uh, on your own uh, appropriate for eternal life in God's presence. So you must experience the water and the spirit, the water is symbolic. John's baptism, John the Baptist's baptism, was symbolic of repentance. And so you must experience repentance. Um, and maybe Nicodemus might understand that reference, but even so, uh, he didn't need to be, he didn't need to repent one like him, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, basically a Jew by themselves because they were already in heaven, already assured because they were children, that is, uh, descendants of Abraham. Um, so how can this be, Nicodemus asks. <clears throat> We've not talked much about the Spirit uh, Jesus says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. In other words, Jesus gives Nicodemus something that he at least understands. He understands the wind. He understands it blows here and there, but he doesn't know where it comes from or what it looks like. And Jesus says, uh, being born of the Spirit is something like that. You can't actually see it, but you know that it exists. You can see its, uh, I'm going to say, its fingerprint, uh, that which it, uh, which follows it. You can see the trees blow in one direction. You can see destruction if it is terribly strong. Uh, and the word spirit and the word wind come from the same base word, which also means the breath. Uh, God breathed 
life into man when he created man. It is his spirit. It is his breath. Same, same word. How can this be? And Jesus kind of chides Nicodemus just a little bit, I think softly. He says, you are Israel's teacher. Now, there he is. He's talking about Nicodemus as a teacher himself. You are, is, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, like the wind, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is a, a self-description that Jesus used. It comes from Daniel, uh, and we don't have time to go back and look at Daniel. Uh, but Daniel talks of the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, so this is an Old Testament uh, prophetic reference to the Messiah. And Jesus takes that uh, self-description title for himself. Only the Son of Man has gone to heaven and returned. Now I have a question and I haven't studied it yet. I've got to follow up on it. Uh, what about uh, those that Jesus and Peter, James, and John saw on the Mount of Transfiguration? Uh, but that's a different subject. We'll get to that uh, someday on another subject. Um, then verse 14, a very interesting 14 and 15, a very interesting reference by Jesus just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the man of so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now Jesus is answering Nicodemus's question, how can this be? And he uses this Old Testament reference, which Nicodemus should know well. But even so, reading it in the Old Testament gives one pause and a, and a scratching of the head. Uh, what does that got to do with anything? We have to go back. Um, I believe it's Exodus, and I, I've got it in my notes, um, but I'm not going to take the time, and my note machine isn't working all of a sudden. There we are. Uh, Numbers, chapter 21. Numbers, not Exodus. The reference is uh, God is displeased uh, with his uh people that he's led out of Egypt. They're not doing what he wants them to do. They're sort of rebellious. And he sends a poisonous snake or snakes among them. And whoever is bitten by the snake dies. And so the people are concerned and terrible and they uh, terrified. And they go to Moses and said, plead, plead with, ask him to plead with God to save them uh, from the poisonous snake. And Moses talks to God, and God says, make a bronze snake and a snake of bronze and put it on a pole and lift it up so that it's high above. And when someone is bitten by a snake, if they believe that I can save them, all they have to do is look up and see the snake lifted up on the pole, and they will live. They won't die. Jesus so that's a matter of faith. And Jesus uses that illustration to say, <clears throat> how can this be? <clears throat> how can you be born again? You must repent. You must have faith. And that faith must be in Jesus. And we're going to get to chapter er, verse 16 just now. You must look up to the cross and not just see a man on the cross. You must believe he is God's son, that he is there on the cross dying for our sins. And we must believe that that will save us. That and the resulting resurrection that comes after uh, that uh, lifting up on the cross. Some say the lifting up is also Jesus, Jesus arising from 
the grave. Now, Nicodemus doesn't know that. It hasn't happened yet. But I imagine that that may be a part of why he assisted Joseph of Arimathea in putting Jesus, uh, uh, taking Jesus' body and put him in the grave. So we get to verse 16, the verse that almost all of us know from heart. So God, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There are a couple of that's. Uh, that, whoever believes in him, that is the result of God showing his love. He loved the world so much that resulted um, in whoever believes in him shall not perish. Uh, I'm sorry, that he, God so loved the world, first of that, that he gave his only son. And then the purpose is that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. The gospel in summary, in one verse, God so loved the world, even though we were already sinners. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus and he's telling each of us, just as Moses had a symbol that provided life to those who believed, who had faith that it would save them. So he, Jesus, the Son of God, for those who believe in him and have faith that belief in him will save them, will have eternal life. Uh, I've run us out of time, verses 17 and 18, just further uh, established it, and they're great verses. Uh, we always, not always, we often stop at verse 16, and I'm, I'm going to have to stop there as well. But we must pause and ask this question. It's not enough to know that Jesus was on the cross. Satan knows that. It's not even enough to know that Jesus rose from the grave. Satan, although defeated by Jesus' resurrection, knows that and knew that. But just like the symbol of Moses that God provided the people through Moses, we must look upon the one lifted up, Jesus, believing that he can save us. Satan doesn't believe that he is Lord, that he, our creator, will save us through our faith. And it is only our faith, not of our works, that grants us that salvation. Have you accepted Jesus having faith that lifted up, whether it be on the cross or in his resurrection? I think it has to include his resurrection. That he is Lord and you commit and give your life to him as Lord. And if so, you too will be saved. Thank you for joining with us in this study. I look forward to continuing in next week as we study from chapter 4 of John's Gospel. Thank you. Good morning.